question. What does cislunar mean? Okay, cislunar is a term that is, is becoming more common because of the uh, ambitions that we're uh, pursuing right now. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it, the, the preface cis uh, indicates something within. So this uh, uh, signifies the, the space within the moon's orbit. Now, generally, we look at cislunar, we generally use the term uh, to, uh, to reference anything in Earth-Moon space. So that would include uh, all of the space between the Earth and the Moon, uh, plus lunar orbits of various types, uh, Lagrange points in the Earth-Moon system can all be considered part of cislunar space. So we'll probably be using that term repeatedly uh, today. Okay. Thank you very much. So, of course, uh, as, as everyone is aware, uh, we are nine days out from the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Uh, momentous occasion, also a uh, kind of a milestone. It's part of a, a bigger discussion and debate that's happening right now about returning to the moon. Um, and, and I think today what we're going to we're going to walk through is not only the challenges that that specific mission faces, but what are the bigger implications? What, it, what, what might that mission sort of offer in terms of bigger possibilities for exploration of the solar system and also uh, improving life back here on Earth? So Jim, I know you have some things you want to walk through. We'll spend 10 or 15 minutes doing that. We'll get to some uh, Q&A, and I want to let everybody on here know that we are, we are recording this session. We will uh, send out uh, the slides afterward, and we'll also send a, a short survey so you can let us know how we're doing uh, on these webinars and how we can make them work better for you. So without further ado, Jim, I will hand it over to you. Okay, so as we uh, get the first slide up, I just want to mention that a, a point that I hope to make uh, throughout this presentation is that in our pursuit of our latest lunar adventures, that we should not lose sight of what comes beyond right. the return to the moon. Uh, that's just the first step. Uh, that's not the end game. We are uh, uh, needing to continue to think about how we strategize the long-term exploration development of cislunar space and beyond. So uh, uh, all of the people with their heads down trying to uh, uh, achieve this return to the moon uh, expeditiously uh, have to also remember that we, we have to answer the question of, okay, what next? Right. Very good. So okay. slides are ready. Okay. Slides are ready. Uh, let's go with the first. Um, all right. So just uh, to go through a timeline so uh, everybody uh, recognizes uh, where we've uh, uh, evolved during uh, during 2019 uh, for the uh, for our lunar ambitions. March 26th, um, Vice President Pence uh, made uh, the announcement on behalf of the administration uh, to uh, return to the moon by 2024 which was an acceleration from uh, NASA's plans, and, uh, and Vice President Pence said, by any means uh, necessary. And that had some people scratching their heads as to, well, what does that exactly mean, by any means necessary? Uh, a few uh, days, or actually a couple of weeks after that announcement, uh, Administrator Breitenstein uh, said, the first phase is speed. Anything that is a distraction from making that happen, we're getting rid of. Now, again, uh, not clear exactly what, uh, what this means, um, but uh, uh, it, it can cause some concern among those who are uh, in other parts of uh, NASA's portfolio not connected uh, with, with human space flight. So moving on to the next, uh, uh, the next bit on the timeline here. On May 13th, uh, supplemental request uh, was put in for FY20 uh, to um, to fund $1.6 billion uh, for, the, uh, for the Artemis program. And also, at the same time, it was requested that um, the NASA administrator be given authority to transfer funds between accounts. Uh, once again, what does this mean for NASA's broader portfolio uh, if, the, uh, if the urgency of this mission uh, allows the administrator to make major changes in, in accounts? But just a day later, uh, if we can have the next uh, bullet. Uh, there was a Senate hearing in which Administrator Bridenstine uh, promised the uh, Senate committee that he would um, uh, he would be getting his additional funding from outside of NASA, not cannibalizing other parts of NASA. Okay, so there's some reassurance for those who are other parts of in other parts of the portfolio. Uh, next bullet, please. Um, and we then we saw. 
uh, on June 13th, uh, a, um, a media interview in which Administrator Bridenstine uh, made uh, the first comments about what the, the total package between now and 2024 would cost, and he estimated between 20 to $30 billion spanning FY20 to 24. Now, uh, this is a, an, an average increase of four to six billion dollars per year beyond what NASA is already right. getting for uh, its budget. Uh, and then, if you if you subtract subtract out the um, uh, the 1.6 billion that they are asking for for FY20, and then just look at the next four years, that means that even at the low end of Bridenstine's estimate, you'd have to get about an additional four and a half billion dollars per year beyond uh, NASA's uh, current budget. So if they stick with those figures, uh, we're, we're looking at some very challenging budget cycles sure. coming up. Okay, next slide, please. And let's go. Uh, let's go back and look at the. Um, what you know? What are some top-level goals? And these, this is my own configuration of sure. how to uh, to phrase these things, uh, rather than anything from an official document. Jim Bettis' view of the universe. Uh, you could say that, <laughs> yes, um, or at least our little corner sure. of the universe, little corner so. solar system. Anyway. Um, so, wh you know, what what are we trying to do in uh, long-term exploration and development of space? The top-level goals, as I've identified them here, are we want to expand human knowledge and human access to resources, and then we want to use that knowledge and those resources to, uh, to feed our economy, expand it, to improve quality of life, and then there may actually be an opportunity for us to improve uh, our, our chances for, for human survival if, for example, we learn techniques that would help us deflect incoming asteroids that may collide with the Earth. I mean, these are, these are all very uh, ambitious and long-term things uh, to, be, um, to be considered as the, as the, the, the top-level goals of, uh, of our space endeavors. Now, next slide, next uh, bullet, please. Um, so what have we accomplished so far in using this kind of approach? Well, obviously, we've revolutionized uh, science with uh, all of the research that we've, uh, we've done and the deep space probes that we sent out and such things. So right. we, we have literally forced the, the rewriting of textbooks in, in multiple fields. Right. Um, uh, so we've, uh, we've used these, these great uh, new, new tools that space has given us and the vantage point of space uh, to, to uh, make us safer, to improve our security, to enrich us um, by uh, uh, supplementing our ability to transfer information. Um, and uh, we've done all of this using basically disposable hardware uh, and um, uh, systems that are designed to, to relay information to, uh, to give us uh, uh, navigational beacons and to, uh, to essentially point cameras at the Earth from overhead. Uh, so, so in other words, it's all been based on the, um, the collection and transfer of electromagnetic uh, in information. So we've done a lot with that. Uh, we've revolutionized the way we do things uh, based on that. But is that it, or is there something more? Let's go to the next bullet. So what's the next plateau for uh, our, our achievements? And what that will need to be is, is actually the physical manipulation of things uh, in space, right. uh, where we actually go and we build things. We service what we have built there. Um, we try to harvest resources, and that would be material and energy resources in space. Uh, we clean up our mess by doing active debris removal. Uh, this kind of physical manipulation of things in space is something that's only been touched on and often in, in uh, uh, experimental or demonstration right. means, but it will be something that will become very routine. Um, we also expect to have human habitation in space on a scale vastly greater than anything we've done so far. Um, right now, we, we do things on a scale of having, say, a half a dozen people on sure. the International Space Station, and that's 
some total of humanity in space right. uh, at, at the present time. Now, how much that will expand, well, it depends on who you talk to, but uh, we are uh, certainly looking at something vastly greater than the handful of people that go up into space at any given time. So how do we manage that? How do we handle the logistics for something uh, like that? How do we um, adapt human physiology for uh, the requirements of space flight? Next, please. All right, so what, what I'm, uh, I'm identifying on this next slide is, again, my own, my own vision of what are the major things that NASA and its partners need to do sure. in order to accomplish uh, the long-term strategy of exploration and, and development, especially what should we be looking at from now through, say, mid-century, the next generation or two. Um, uh, and, and I've identified five things uh, that I think are, are really critical for this. And the first one is, is to, to enable uh, aggressive development in cis lunar space. Um, and this is uh, consisting of a lot of the things that have been already done by NASA and other government agencies right. Uh, successfully in the general stimulus to uh, societal activity, including uh, the economy, funding or performing early stage research, uh, things that are far from the point where they can generate a market and profits, um, uh, building or sponsoring the construction of essential infrastructure that has multi-mission applications, uh, becoming an anchor tenant uh, for um, for new developments uh, so that they uh, can, can uh, get on their feet with a little help uh, from, from the government. These are, all, these are all things that have been successfully uh, approached uh, by governments to stimulate things like transportation infrastructure, right. for example. Um, so that's, that's uh, one of the, the things. Let's go to the next uh, bullet. Um, the, the, the two greatest physiological challenges that we have in, in long duration spaceflight are adapting to microgravity, living in space sure. for long periods of time uh, in conditions that are, that are not at all normal uh, for those of us on Earth, and also the radiation exposure question. Uh, there uh, has, has been debate on both of these issues as to how serious is this really, uh, but from everything that I've been able to absorb over the years, uh, I, I've um, uh, come to the belief that that these are the two key things that are potential showstoppers sure. that we have to overcome if we are going to actually be living and working in space right. uh, for, for the long haul. Uh, so we have to experiment with all kinds of countermeasures, shielding, all the things that will be needed to maintain health. Next uh, bullet, please. Now, this, this is a key thing. To demonstrate that we can live off the land. If everything that we do in space is consisting totally of uh, sending all of the supplies and things that we need uh, from the Earth uh, and not being able to use any local resources, then you are never going to get beyond the stage of something equivalent to an Antarctic research right. station. Uh, that, that it's not going to be true settlement or routine business activity if you can't find a way to use local resources in as, as much as possible. Sure. Uh, so, so that's something that we have to um, uh, uh, get ourselves uh, trained up on. And the best place to do it is in cis lunar space, right. close to home. Learn the stuff in your backyard. OK, um, next. All right, planetary defense and, and, and survival. I, I see this as having, having uh, two parts. So and I already mentioned one, which I, I think of as the outsider threat, and that is the, the uh, rogue asteroid that happens to cr cross Earth's path and, and may hit us someday and do serious damage. Um, uh, so uh, so that, that planetary defense mission is something we've been talking about for a long time, but uh, uh, have, have not uh, engaged in it to the level where we can deploy test missions yet to, to see how that right. um, uh, how that might effectively work. So the, the other part of it that I see is what I like to think of as the, the, um, the insider threat, uh, and that is survival here on the Earth. And we've already discovered uh, for many years now 
how effective it is to have observations of various kinds um, uh, that uh, have as much scope as, and coverage as possible to uh, judge what's going on in our environment on the Earth in the atmosphere um, uh, and uh, what, uh, what trends there are, uh, what emergencies we may, might need to deal with. Right. Uh, this type of Earth observation is, is uh, something that's brought us great benefits so far, but there are, there are still more things that we can do uh, to have better coverage uh, and better information uh, from the space systems that we have. So being better custodians of planet Earth and observing what's going on there that might pose a threat uh, are gonna be, is going to be really important for us. And then the last uh, item is um, um, a, a new type of, of science missions in which the, you have, uh, first of all, uh, in the cases when you have humans on planetary surfaces, uh, close interaction between those humans and, and robots so that they act as, as one interactive system mm. um, to do their research. And for deeper space missions, the automated missions, uh, instead of finding all kinds of contorted ways to stick something in the nose cone of a rocket uh, and hopefully it'll deploy properly when we get into space, actually building large probes in space to be deployed later uh, to, uh, to the outer solar system. So I, I see those as the five big challenges that um, that NASA and its partners uh, will, will have to be uh, be tackling. So okay. let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what we have here is a list of things that are part of the, um, uh, the cislunar infrastructure. Uh, now, some of these things, you know, we hear a lot about. Uh, the, uh, the space transportation capabilities, how do we get from Earth to various orbits? Um, how do we um, um, uh, create habitats that, uh, that people can, can live in for extended right. periods of time? Uh, and and we, we hear less about other things here. And, and I, I guess what I'd like to emphasize with this slide is that uh, as we focus on some of these, on some of these big uh, requirements, let's not forget all of these others because you need a coordinated package. You can't uh, create a couple of pieces and say, and say you're done uh, uh, until you've, you've covered things like how do we um, uh, do that extraction of materials. Uh, you, can, you can identify, oh, we found a lot of water ice on the moon. That's great. That's valuable to have. Uh, but it's not automatic that we will be able to easily and economically extract it, process it, sure. and get it to where it's useful. We still have a lot of steps to do to, to figure that out. Um, uh, the on-orbit servicing that uh, I believe is going to be a, a, a really um, uh, uh, essential and, and successful thing in the, in the, the next generation of space activity. Um, uh, has, has some challenges to it as well. Uh, and um, uh, so, so, so all of these things, if we are going to be doing manufacturing on, on orbit, um, uh, if we are going to be building large facilities, let's, there's, there's a lot that we have to uh, concentrate on. And, and I should emphasize, too, that um, I've had discussions about this with uh, Kevin O'Connell over at uh, the Department of sure. Commerce, uh, and he's well aware that if, if his office or what his office evolves into uh, is going to be the one-stop shop for most of what's on this list, then he's really got his work cut out for him because uh, they're, they're tackling some challenges right now, like how to uh, start to manage space traffic uh, management duties for uh, civil and, um, and uh, commercial activities right. in space. Uh, and that's a tough challenge for that small but growing office. Um, but they, uh, Kevin recognizes that there is much more that will be uh, required of his office and, and, and possibly at a very fast pace. For example, if, if on-orbit servicing like really takes off quickly, uh, then there are going to be uh, regulatory concerns that, um, that he will have to attend to very soon and will need the resources to do that. So the, the, the general rule is that technology moves faster than policy. Right. So, uh, so sometimes you're playing catch-up 
a lot of times you're playing catch up in, in the policy realm. So. Okay. Um, hey, Dave. All right. Dave, this is yeah. Terry. Um, just to let you know, Matt has a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I see that, and we will get to those very shortly here. Oh, okay, Keto, I want to make you aware of them. Thank you yep. very much. We've got one more slide that before I stop talking too much. Okay, so um, uh, finally, I'll just look at uh, at some of the uh, what I've identified here as known unknowns. We we have some questions that are uh, still in need of answers, and at least in this case, we know what the questions are. Right. Um, but um, uh, I've uh, as I've pictured here with these three inquisitive gentlemen here uh, asking asking these questions. Um, what, what solutions are going to be employed to mitigate the cost of access to orbit um, and also to the um, interorbital transportation as well? Uh, the big question of how many people will routinely be needed uh, to operate all the things that we want to do in, for starters, this lunar space. Um, that is going to make a big difference in the logistical support that's going to be required and uh, uh, will depend a lot on how much we can live off the land sure. when we figure out uh, how to do that. Uh, how much will be done robotically? And maybe the answer is we should be aiming to do as much as possible robotically uh, rather than having um, uh, humans in situations where they don't actually need to be. Uh, another, another question. Um, uh, and I alluded to this before, the, the uh, uh, resource extraction, manufacturing, uh, we, we've had ideas about, about this for decades, uh, but we have not done all the proof of concept work yet to demonstrate how this could be done in a way that, that adds value sufficiently to make it an economical proposition. Sure. Um, and um, as, as uh, I think I've appropriately attached this bubble to, to Buzz Aldrin, this is the kind of question he would ask, uh, which orbits and points in system lunar space will prove most useful for various tasks and, and low energy uh, transits? Um, so uh, you're going to have to place things like um, navigation systems that go beyond GPS. I mean, GPS was designed for navigation right. on Earth and is not going to be as effective on the moon. So you, you need navigation. You need some uh, communications uh, added to uh, cis-lunar space. As we've seen already, the Chinese have put a communications relay on the lunar far side so they can talk to their, their rover that's on the, on the far side on the surface. Um, uh, there's also the question of if, if you are moving large amounts of materials, whether you're uh, mining or manufacturing things, and you're going to need storage in space. Right. Where do you store these things so that they are going to be easily accessible by the transport devices that uh, need to deliver them. Um, uh, and uh, part of that's going to depend on things like uh, if you extract materials from the moon and then you're going to process them. Do you process them right there on the moon or do you do that somehow in orbit? We have to figure those things out. Um, and, and, and lastly, what about the, the geopolitical situation? Okay, who are the, the good partners going to be? Will there be potential adversaries out there that will kind of throw a monkey wrench into the mix? Um, will there be terrestrial conflict that somehow affects our behaviors uh, on orbit? Uh, and will decision makers be, be uh, considering the implications of orbital cooperation while on Earth there is conflict? Now, right now we have a situation in which we're we're working very well with the Russians right. aboard the space station. Right. We're having some issues with them elsewhere. Right. Um, uh, how will situations like that play out in the future when we're talking about more partners uh, and uh, a more diverse set uh, of, of partners? Uh, and we, we, we just can't predict those things, but we have to recognize that they are, they are out there. Absolutely. So, okay. All right. So, did you want to start taking the sure? Questions? Yeah. Some good questions from our friends, Mr. Uh, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Colin. Mm -hmm. um, and we got some questions stacking up from the audience. Before we get to those, we would like to ask the audience a question. And so, Terry, if we could bring up the first poll. 
can get a little input here. Which poll did you want? Oh, sorry, the, uh, the one about NASA's Artemis program. There we go. All right, everybody, so if you wanted to just uh, click on the little radio button, you can see uh, a little broadcaster's results so you guys can all see what, what the collective thinking is. That's right. Results coming in. Fairly one-sided at this point. Yes. It's quite Very one -sided. Nice. So, seeing some skepticism about that timeline. Maybe they think we'll land one earlier. Uh, well, well, no, 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 no let's, let's, I won't go there. Let's that. not get into that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, it does seem does seem a bit uh, lopsided in in the answers and Indeed. and and it, certainly you you have a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, between now and then. We haven't even started working on a lunar lander. We need to develop a new generation of uh, lunar surface spacesuits. Those are not in, inconsequential things. Those are, uh, th those are big developments. Uh, and, um, uh, and then there's the question of, that I mentioned before about the, the budgets. Uh, if indeed the numbers that, that uh, Administrator Bridenstine quoted uh, recently are anywhere close to accurate, uh, this will be just like unprecedented increase in, in, in NASA's top line budget and, right. and uh, what are the chances that that is going to happen cons consistently for the next yep. uh, four years uh, in, in the situation that we're, that we're in today. Sure. That, that could be the, the, the biggest hurdle. Yep. That's quite a challenge. All right, so Brian Harvey, thank you for submitting this first question. Jim, your thoughts on the best ways to commercialize space? Well. Um, I've been um, uh, a, a big believer in, as I think I mentioned earlier, that that uh, the uh, on-orbit servicing is going to be a uh, a big new development in right. space. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm less uh, confident in uh, in space tourism. Some people think space tourism is going to be the next big thing. Um, and uh, certainly there has been a significant amount of enthusiasm shown for that, uh, but the um, suborbital space tourism is going to have a limited window in which you're going to have right. participants and interest in that, and then people are going to say, okay, what's next? They want to do orbital space tourism. Well, that's not just a simple step. They say, okay, you know, next year we'll do orbital space tourism. Right. No, it's not that easy. It's, it's significantly harder and you uh, preferably should have some place to go such as a, a private space station sure. that could be visited um, so the 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 cost the challenges the risks to that are, are much greater and um, and I'm not sure how we will get through that transition from the suborbital to the orbital space tourism right. so I have okay. some skepticism about that sure um, uh, for the uh, Proposed new uh, uh, large LEO constellations. Um, uh, well, I think technologically, I, I think those are uh, 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 don't don't have any any big showstoppers. But the management of such systems and uh, determining which ones will um, uh, come to fruition and which ones will fall by the wayside uh, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, we we all remember back the experience in the late 90s when some things like this were proposed and the constellations then were not even as big as what we're talking right. about now. Um, so, um, so uh, but in general, in, in talking about cislunar development, the private sector has to become partners in this. Uh, this is not just uh, national space agencies getting together. Right. It has to be the commercial sector because Unlike the earliest days of the space age, um, the commercial sector has uh, as much or more expertise as the government agencies do. Uh, they've, they've developed along those lines for, for, for decades now, um, and, um, and, and they also have more resources. Uh, so it, you, know, you have, say, divisions of Lockheed Martin or Boeing right. that, 
that have more people than all of the civil servants at NASA. Uh, uh, you, you have investment dollars uh, in the many billions. If you look at how um, uh, uh, big developments in the private sector are made, such as you know, the, the years ago the Alaska Pipeline, uh, hmm. that was a huge you bet your company kind of investment. Right. So some oil companies got together and decided that this would be a profitable venture and made massive investments. Uh, and um, and they made it work. Right. That's the kind of thing that's going to have to happen in the private sector. They have to get skin in the game, and they have to be convinced that there's going to be a long-term benefit to sure. this. So okay. I guess we should move on to other questions. Sure, and real quickly, I mentioned you talked about on-orbit servicing. If you go to aerospace.org slash policy and click on papers, you will find a game changer on on-orbit servicing where we sort of analyze uh, the maturity of that particular uh, method and, and approach. Seems like a good stepping stone to that sort of local mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. we talked about. Right. All right. So next question comes from Matt Jones. How important do you think advanced deep space propulsion capabilities will be for the kinds of activities that we're talking about? Uh, okay. For um, Human exploration and occupation. Um, uh, that's one I'll have to answer. I don't know because because uh, it's been sold. The, the nuclear thermal propulsion has been sold as a way to to get places faster. Right. Like we don't have to take six or eight months to get to Mars, um, which uh, which is a good thing. But. Um, uh, 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 but again, we're still in early stages of development uh, for that, and and ultimately, will it be something decided to be fitting for human travel uh, in space? Um, now, my my own picture of how we get to Mars is probably different than what most people uh, are thinking about. I I think the time to go to Mars is when we can we can have a a uh, pretty large spacecraft that can spin up at least part of the spacecraft for artificial gravity mm. um, so that uh, you, can, you can do something like spin it up for full Earth gravity when you leave Earth and then gradually wind it down ah. so that you reach one-third gravity, which is the Martian gravity, by the time you get there and then the crew is already prepared oh, sure. for the new gravity. Sure. And then reverse the process on, on the way back. Sure. Um, so, uh, but we need to do some experiments in um, uh, on-orbit practice with a variable gravity facility to find out well, what is really the optimum. Do you need to have um, uh, people uh, traveling through space at 1G spun up in their spacecraft? Or can you physiologically retain all of the health that you, that you need by just doing half of Earth gravity or 60% right. or something right. like that? Because you know, the faster you spin something up, the more of an engineering challenge it becomes. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so we need to do some tests, so, and we can do uh, a mission like the one I just described right. in Earth orbit with a variable right. gravity facility and find out if that works. Is, is that helpful? So, I, I know I've gotten off the track from, from Matt's question, but uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not uh, 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 really sold on a big future for human travel on nuclear-powered rockets here. Right. We jump to a question from uh, Jamil. Do you think there's enough data about the psychological effects of spending uh, prolonged periods in space? You talked about the effects on the human body of, of spending mm -hmm. extended times in orbit. What about the psychological? Impact? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, given the fact that, uh, with only a couple of exceptions, our, our experience goes to about six months, um, that uh, uh, we, we still have a lot more to learn, and using um, something like a lunar settlement, uh, a lunar outpost, uh, might help us uh, to to study effects of of things like multi-year separations sure. uh, from from the Earth. Uh, and and remember, as you get further away from the Earth, say if you're going to Mars, and that is, it, it, communications even get harder because you have the time lag uh, of the uh, the radio signals. Right. Um, so you you, uh, you can't even count on real time communications with Earth. Sure. Uh, anymore, um, so that that is going to have an effect, uh, I think, too. Um, so uh, quite a bit more uh, to uh, to learn in that area. There there had been proposals that um, uh, choosing the crews for these very long missions um, 
should uh, lean very heavily towards compatibility of the crew members. Hmm. Um, uh, and uh, that makes it harder to match up proper skill set with compatibility as well, and then hopefully that compatibility that they have demonstrated on Earth is not going to change radically as they go out onto uh, the, the mission. Uh, we, we, we have to do trial runs of, of, of those things. Right. Uh, David has a question about how NASA can mitigate risk with some of these high-risk investments um, and acting as this uh, anchor tenant for new companies when, you know, if things don't pan out, your thoughts there? Well, the investment that, um, that, that, that NASA makes, uh, now we, we've come to think of NASA as an organization that builds things and goes places. Right. Um, uh, but we, we, we have to understand that the, the character of NASA is, is changing, um, uh, and some of that has become uh, very evident in the past few years as they've gotten into like uh, commercial servicing the space station sure. and have become much more open than they used to be uh, uh, for uh, uh, development of commercial ventures that could take over things they used to do themselves. When NASA was formed, there was nobody else to do these things. They had to do everything. They had to fund everything. That's not true anymore, and, um, and they should be selective about what they do. But when they see something that that is either directly useful to themselves or U.S. government applications or things that have been judged to uh, be harbingers of, of uh, new markets, uh, then those things are, uh, are worth investing in. Uh, there, there's always the argument about, oh, we don't want to have the government choosing winners. Well, the, the government accounts for something like, what is it, nearly a quarter of GDP. So the government's got to choose something. Right. The government's a big player. I'm sorry, the government's part of the market. You can't say that they're completely severed from, uh, from the uh, U.S. or world market. The, the, the government buys a lot of stuff. And, um, um, and, and that means that uh, uh, there's really no crime in them being market influencers. Sure. Um, yeah, you don't want this leaking to the point of favoritism for particular companies for political right. reasons or right. something of that nature. Right. But uh, the government has to pick something. Uh, the government has needs, uh, and the the government should be encouraging uh, segments of the private sector to satisfy those needs. Right. Does anybody have uh, a question they want to jump in with on the phone? Unmute their phone and do this the old-fashioned way. No takers. Okay. Well, let's jump back up to, uh, uh, let's see, we have some other questions here. Any uh, thoughts on the changes in NASA's human exploration program that uh, happened today? That just occurred last yeah. night. Um, uh, you know, just heard the news this morning, so I, I don't know really what to think about that uh, yet, um, because there were not a lot of indication given as to uh, uh, exactly why uh, this uh, this change was done at this time, uh, uh, other than you know seeming indication that it's time for fresh blood. Uh, so uh, these uh, um, uh, the, the, the folks that have been moved out of these uh, leadership positions have uh, been with NASA a long time and uh, respected characters. So. Um, um, not a lot to as, go on as, well, as the president often says, let's see what happens. Sure. So. Okay, let's uh, let's ask our audience another question, uh, Terry. If you could bring up the poll about um, people living in space, we've had a, a bit of discussion here about the impacts of living in space, and I'd be curious to know what do you all out there think uh, the uh, will be looking like in terms of an in-space population by 2040. All right. Results coming in. It's 
show what we show folks what we've got here. Let's a little bit of optimism, I guess, depending okay. on how yeah. you define it. Uh, majority of you thinking between a hundred and a thousand. Jim, you have a well, thoughts there? Well, that that's uh, that that is interesting. Um, uh, so uh, I noticed that we uh, didn't seem to get any takers for uh, over or, for over a thousand. No. Um, yeah, that's only a little over 20 years away. So, uh, right. so a lot has to, uh, to to happen to make that um, to make that possible. Um, so we we've heard uh, proposals for space development that have specified uh, ideas uh, for how many people would be living and working in space. And these some of these go back decades. So uh, I, I I sort of grew up on the Jerry O'Neill uh, space colonies, uh, in in which he was proposing orbiting colonies that. Uh, uh, that even in the early stages would have like 100,000 people sure. uh, and up to a million people on a single uh, space colony. Uh, more recently, we've seen that uh, ULA has proposed uh, something uh, that they call Cislunar 1000, which was uh, an effort to get to the point where there were, are 1,000 people living and working oh, okay. in space. And that's just a couple of years ago that um, they came up with that. Uh, We've heard uh, Jeff Bezos uh, talking about how he uh, would expect to see uh, a million people uh, living in space. Uh, he does not give any precise time frame uh, for sure. that, but his ambition is uh, to have these large numbers uh, of people in various places around the solar system doing useful things. Um, so w one of the questions I've always had, though, is um, whether the the number of people living and working in space is really a good metric. Hmm. Um, now we we are doing this. If you go back to like the, the the goals and objectives that I talked about earlier, right. of increasing human knowledge and and boosting our economy and 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 things of that nature, um, uh, we we can do a lot of that with robotic systems. And as our uh, uh, Robotic hardware and, uh, uh, and and software systems improve, uh, and we can build larger things on orbit. Uh, do we do we really need lots of people to operate uh, all of those things? Uh, shouldn't we be measuring things by how much value are we adding by our activities in right. space, regardless of how many people right. are involved in hands-on operation? Um, so, uh, so I'm I'm not completely sold on on the notion that number of people in space is a good metric for progress, um, but um, uh, but I I do anticipate that uh, there will be a lot more people in space, but they may they may stick pretty close to you know cis lunar space for a long time to come, sure. uh, and that movement further out in the solar system for any significant number of people uh, may be very far downrange. Sure. So, Jim, a lot of what you've talked about here and in other things you've written, um, it's uh, the sort of the, the big picture uh, of what uh, Return to the Moon can act, you know, acting as a springboard to further exploration. And the mm -hmm. amount of time, you touched on it here, the consistent development over not just five years, but decades that this mm -hmm. will require for true success. We've also talked about administrative administration priorities. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see a consistent decades-long sort of uh, progress being made when uh, different presidential administrations have different priorities and they change or shift focus? Yeah, we've we've seen that pretty much as uh, each new administration comes in, something very significant changes right in in the in the approach, in the priorities, and the funding level. Um, uh, that's that's certainly been true uh, uh, very much so in, in, in recent times. So um, what what I think we, we, we're seeing as a, a transition that we're going through right now, and, and sometimes you don't see these things when they're actually happening to right. you. It's only later that you come back and realize it. Um, the, the period of the last few years, say from the time that the shuttle program ended in 2011, uh, and, and look at, at what has happened, um, the, the realization that uh, you 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 can't be just depending on something like the shuttle for your access to orbit, and then we see more and more private sector participants right. 
jumping on board to try and provide that at, at a variety of levels, from you know small rockets to very big ones. Um, uh, you uh, you also see um, more ambitions in uh, you know high precision uh, Earth observation. Uh, again, you know in the private sector, you see the uh, incorporation of uh, 3D printed components. Oh, sure. Uh, to speed up the process of developing space systems. Right. Uh, some are uh, proposing that uh, 3D printing technologies will be used in space to use yep. the materials we find there to yep. create systems that are already uh, in space. Um, uh, so, so as these things uh, find more active participants, and especially outside of the government, that's how things are going to start ramping up, and we're already so we're already seeing the the ambitions to put private space stations in orbit to do a variety of things, including uh, manufacturing and tourism and such, uh, uh, more space transportation, more space applications capabilities, um, uh, and and so we're so we're getting to the point where we realize that um, that the it's it's not necessarily the way of the future to depend on government for everything. Sure. That um, uh, as the private sector finds their their niche and, and their their ability to make some some profit, that they will uh, adopt these things, and uh, that is that is a transition that we are living right now. That sure. and, and I, I would put, like I say I would put 2011 as the real start of this. Uh, much more private activity taking over things that we thought were either never going to be done or things that were only government responsibilities before, right? Uh, so, so I, I think we're on that track uh, already, uh, and um, uh, and that government agencies, NASA certainly, but also transportation department, commerce department, are recognizing these things uh, and saying, how can we pave the way to 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 make this happen? How can we remove roadblocks? Right. Uh, you know, how can we um, encourage or provide? Uh, research investment to, to make these things happen. Sure. Okay. Questions in the chat. I haven't seen anyone pop up. Or, again, you can uh, unmute your phone and pipe up there if you like. Or I'll start asking questions and then this thing will go right off the rails. Oh. Well, that could be interesting. And it could, could be. Um, what, what kind of benefits might we see back here on Earth? Um, you know, I think that's often when you see public discussion about NASA investments, space investments, people wonder, what's that do for me back here at home? And, um, you know, beyond satellite TV and, and some other, you know, other communication and entertainment-based services that, that people experience, now what else might they get out of uh, the, the, the sort of um, uh, burgeoning development of cislunar space? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, Obviously, those of us who are in the business recognize we're already getting a lot, right? Uh, and uh, and that there there is more that can be done in communications, in navigation, in remote sensing, um, and uh, what what's going to be uh, what's going to be improved in the um, uh, the long term development of uh, the use of space resources is to to find a way to uh, relieve pressures on things on the earth. Uh, now, um, uh, some are uh, big believers in the development of solar power satellites that will generate large mm -hmm. amounts of power sure. and beam them down to the yeah. earth yeah. Uh, so that we can uh, use those to, to um, supplement um, uh, what's being produced here on earth because uh, a lot of people looked at the numbers about how much electricity demand is growing sure. and growing and growing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it's going to be hard to meet uh, all of that. And, and in fact, um, over a 20 to 30 year period, we're talking about worldwide like trillions of dollars of investment, right? Just in power infrastructure. Well, some of that trillions of dollars could go to space-based infrastructure. Now, something like that. Uh, no single space technology is a silver bullet that's going to solve everything for everybody. And you're not going to say, oh, well, solar power satellites will give right. all the world's power. Right. No, no, it's always going to be a mix. Um, 
and, and that's going to be true uh, of, uh, of other things as well. I mean, overhead observation, you can do a, a lot of great stuff with satellites, but that doesn't mean that aircraft and balloons are going to go away. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think we're going to find space technologies more and more intermingled with the, with the existing uh, terrestrial uh, technologies right. uh, to, uh, to be able to supplement them, um, uh, and they will back each other up. Um, so did you have another question come in? Yeah, we had a question come in from William about, and this is a question that I would not have thought to ask, about uh, Earth, Moon, and Grange points for economic development. Yeah, well, um, the, it's probably to explain what a Lagrange point. Okay, is. Uh, so um, and uh, and maybe if we could go to, I have a, a backup slide that that shows yeah. the Lagrange points. If that's oh, can we make that any bigger? Let's see. Um, yeah, it was, uh, Terry, do we just need to press this? Uh, let's see, we'll full screen it for a second. Ah, there we okay. go. Yeah, so there's a. Uh, uh, NASA depiction of uh, of the Earth-Moon system with uh, the Lagrange points, and you can see there are five of them. And and for for anyone not familiar with that, these are uh, relatively stable gravitational points in a two-body system. Oh, okay. um, and what you can see is that L1 is uh, is between the Earth and the Moon, uh, closer to the Moon, so that the gravity between the two is somewhat balanced. Okay. Uh, L2 is, is, on, um, is beyond the moon. That's the position where the, um, um, uh, you know, where, where the relay satellites from, uh, to, to allow communication to the lunar far side could be placed. Okay. Um, and um, uh, there, there was, for, for many years, there was much discussion about L4 and L5 uh, to, uh, to put Habitats there, or manufacturing facilities there, uh, and uh, and and I'm thinking that it, it may be that storage warehouses might be hmm. uh, something that would uh, find a good place Interesting. there. So those spots will will um, require relatively less uh, energy sure. propellant things to to do station keeping uh, in those locations, and that's why they're uh, they're useful. You can keep them in an orbit without expending a lot of uh, fuel that needs to be constantly resupplied. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Jerry O'Neill, for example, saw L4 and L5 as as uh, the, the locations for his uh, for his space colonies. Um, uh, so, we we have to consider the fact that if you notice that the 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 Earth, the Moon, and the L4 and 5 uh, locations are pretty much our equilateral triangle sure. there. So, in other words, there's the same distance from the Earth to the Moon is the distance is the, same, the same as the distance from the Earth to L4 or the Earth to L5, um, or either one of those points to the Moon. You know, so it's still a long way. You're still talking a quarter million right. uh, miles between those locations. So there is going to be a consideration of how much energy does it take to get between those two locations? But once you're there, you have the ability to um, uh, to to stay there with uh, a relatively small amount of um, uh, uh, station keeping. Um, so um, I, I would imagine that if we do get to the point of doing uh, uh, space manufacturing or uh, or processing or storage of, of materials extracted from the moon or even near Earth asteroids, we may find that one of these, one or more of these Lagrange points would be uh, great places to put those facilities or whether they're for, for uh, uh, work being done or for storage. Uh, uh, because when, when there are transport ships that are going between different orbits in cislunar space, they're always going to be looking for the least energy trajectory. Right. And if these spots can provide that uh, for them, then that's all to the good. Um, uh, I was involved with some of uh, our uh, researchers out in Colorado Springs uh, on, on, on a study uh, for NASA that looked at a variety of lunar orbits as well, uh, high inclination, elliptical orbits, and things like that that would serve different purposes for, for communications or for uh, transit between the Earth and the moon. Um, so all of those things are, 
uh, being explored at uh, at some level now, but would have to be uh, uh, to uh, tested and explored further uh, to uh, to allow us to uh, determine what kind of work we're going to do in what position. Very good. We've got about four minutes left at this point. Uh, if there are any other questions, again, either on the phone or the chat, please post them. Um, in the meantime, we have one more poll. This one's about uh, game-changing technology. And we are curious to get your input on which of these, uh, which of these you think will have the biggest impact between now and 2040. So start weighing in. I believe you can only pick one. Oh, here they come. Pretty even so far. It's like watching a race. Exciting, isn't it? Very exciting. I'm broadcasting the results here so everyone can see where everyone else is going. Like on orbit servicing. 3D printing and water ice harvesting are our top three. A little movement. Jim, what, uh, which of these um, do you kind of key on? I, I think I, I kind of lean toward this. Uh, since we put, um, yeah, I think we put a uh, time limit over the next generation of it. I, I would say on orbit servicing is what I would, uh, what I would vote for. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think, I think the water ice on the moon thing is going to be a little a little bit slower than some people expect because the, we we have yet to determine. Uh, and I've been some, to some workshops about this. We 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 have yet to determine how much we will be able to find the water ice in large contiguous masses and how much it might be chopped up into thousands of little patches. All right. So uh, so you have to track all of that down. And then how do you extract it? You're not going to send up an astronaut with an ice pick. Uh, this is. Uh, 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 in locations and shaded areas on the moon, with the, which are just a few degrees above absolute zero, um, so they're going to be essentially as hard as rock. Right. So you're going to have to have special machinery to do that. Absolutely. Uh, and then you have to transport the stuff somewhere to a processing facility to extract the oxygen, hydrogen uh, from them. And then once you've done that extraction, you have to take those uh, products and take them to where they're going to be used. Right. So there's expense at every step of the way, uh, and and uh, new procedures to be developed. And I've heard uh, a geologist from the Colorado School of Mines talk about how tough the terrain is mm -hmm. around where we suspect the water is. Right. So, so that that's going to be a, a, a tough it's thing. It's to not just sticking your cup under the dispenser. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's only if we're that easy. Maybe maybe someday. Yeah. Maybe someday. yeah, yeah so. Well, again, Jim, thank you so much for your time and, and your insights, and thank all of you for uh, joining us. Uh, we, we shared Jim's short bio in the uh, invitation we sent out, and, and as you saw in that bio, uh, Jim wrote a paper on uh, this lunar development, I believe, last year. Also, yes, I did. Uh, yes, so I have it up. There I have right here. Right here. <laughs> Very good. This lunar development, what to build and why, it can also be found at aerospace.org slash policy. Click on papers. And Jim, you've written a couple books on uh, uh, lunar development and, and uh, space yeah, topics yes. as well. Uh, yes, I did. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, I, I looked at the my my first book looked at um, how these things help the Earth. You know, like what's in it for Earth, right? Uh, and and um, uh, and the uh, and the second book was uh, was more of uh, what do we need to be doing now so that we are a space-bearing sure. society by mid-century. Right. Very good. You may actually so, know what you're talking about. That's good for the sake of the event. I, well, I'd like to think so. Yeah, anyway. I would too. So, but, I would say, but it is fun to talk about in any case. Very much so. Well, again, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, we will be sending out a post-event survey. Uh, we will also send the slides around, and um, we will make this recording available uh, in case you want to live the magic again or <laughs> share with your friends and colleagues. So thank you so much. Have a great day, Jim. Uh, thank you as well. All right. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye now. Nicely done, guys. We can uh, you, talk. We can talk offline. Uh, oh no, no. Debrief. All right.
Alright, bye. bye.